Amy Goodman. Here at the UN Climate Summit in Marrakesh, Morocco, the World Bank has just published a new report finding natural disasters are pushing 26 million people into poverty each year. World Bank President Jim Kim said, quote, severe climate shocks threaten to roll back decades of progress against poverty, unquote. One of the hardest hit areas by climate change has been the continent of Africa. We're joined now by one of the leading African environmentalists, Nemo Bassi, director of the Health of Mother Earth Foundation in Nigeria, author of several books, including his latest, Oil Politics, Echoes of Ecological Wars. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Nemo. Thank you very much. It's great to see you again. I recall seeing you several years ago being dragged out by security protesting at one of the previous UN summits. So you are a voice inside and outside these summits. Um, well, we're speaking now when uh, the president-elect of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, has, by all accounts, threatened to pull out of the UNFCC, the United Nations Framework um, on Climate Change. Can you explain what that is and the significance of this? Uh, I would only hope that it doesn't, this doesn't happen because... Uh, we've just been, the world has just been celebrating the fact that many countries came together to agree on the Paris Agreement, which I don't agree, I agree with, uh, but, but which showed a sense that at least most countries agreed that this was something that needed to be tackled. Now, the Framework Convention on Climate Change was drawn up and signed up in 1992, and it really had some very critical principles. principles and it was the UN uh, uh, framework, uh, United Convention, Nations on framework climate Convention on change Climate Change, was uh, signed off on in the United States by President George H.W. Bush. Right, in 1992. And now the basic principles of that convention includes the, the spirit of equity and the, what is known in the core parlance as common but differentiated responsibilities, which recognizes the historical responsibilities of rich countries, industrialized countries, who have taken up virtually all the carbon, the space that carbon could ever occupy the atmosphere without the Earth experiencing catastrophic global warming. Uh, so the Convention recognizes that those who contributed most to the problem should also do most in solving it, in terms of providing climate finance, providing technology, and showing some leadership in terms of cutting emissions at source. But, you know, over the years, especially since uh, COP15 at Copenhagen, the COP you referred to where I was thrown out from. Now, we are the Nigerian, I mean, the African leader, leading negotiator, Ambassador Lumumba, wept at a press conference saying that uh, following, I mean, having a decision, uh, coming out with an agreement that looks at uh, temperature that will go up to more than one degree was like sentencing Africa to death. And I watched Africans celebrate 10 billion Naira dollars being offered per year up till 2020, and then a hundred billion dollars from then henceforth. Now, that the principle of the Copenhagen Accord is what eventually was crystallized as the Paris Agreement. Now, wasn't that Obama? The beginning was, was Copenhagen, was Obama, the no. end is the Paris <laughs> yeah, really, Agreement. Really, is that was the beginning, beginning of Obama and the end of Obama's tenure. Now, the beginning of his tenure derailed the climate negotiations because from then it became an issue of countries making voluntary pledges on what they go, how they're going to cut emissions and what they're going to do about global warming. Before then, the regime, the Kyoto Protocol, was all about nations having legally binding commitments to cutting emissions. But now it's pledge and review, and there are many, from the Paris Agreement, what the rich countries are going to do mostly is simply to uh, engage in carbon trading and carbon offsetting. So they'll keep on polluting, and then they assume that their pollution is offset by soils in Africa, forests in Africa, and elsewhere. What if President Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but not the UNFCCC? If he pulls out from the, climate, uh, from the Paris Agreement, it would mean that the world would see clearly what we've been seeing all these years, that the U.S. has not been very uh, positive in terms of climate negotiations. The U.S. has been a stumbling block in terms of binding commitments, in terms of countries stepping up ambition, it's been the pressure of industry, I believe, and vested interest has kept the U.S. from, from advancing in ambition. And the U.S. being so powerful in the, COP, in the whole process has pulled back all the other rich industrialized nations from doing what they ought to do. So if, the, if Donald Trump pulls out, 
of the Paris, I mean, the U.S. pulls out the Paris Agreement, it will now show that, look, the war, world, now you don't have the major force that will be keeping you from showing some ambition, so you can begin afresh to do something that will help the world. But if the U.S. pulls out of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it means that this is a very hard day for the world, because then there will be, uh, it would put the whole exercise into extreme jeopardy. Mm. This summit here in Marrakesh, Morocco, is being held on the continent of Africa. The significance of this, Nemo Bassi, you from Nigeria. You know, people have called this the African Cup. And my question is, why didn't you call the Durban, Durban Cup African Cup? The Durban uh, South Actually, Africa this, Cup. Is, this is COP22. For us, it's like cash 22. Because uh, either direction, Africa is going to lose. Uh, the, the rich countries, are forcing the process to go in the direction of polluters continue to pollute without stopping pollution. And if polluters continue to pollute, no matter how much money anybody makes from carbon trading, from carbon offsetting, like reducing emission from deforestation and degradation and all the other marks of uh, uh, market environmentalism, is not going to uh, add up to actually reducing the amount of carbon in the, carbon in the atmosphere, which means the temperature is going to rise. Right now, countries have put on the table what they call nationally determined contributions. And from the, and the Paris Agreement said we are aiming at 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase or well below 2 degrees Celsius. We don't know what well below 2 degrees means, but from what the nations have said they're going to do, the world is set for over three degrees Celsius temperature increase. And that means setting Africa on fire. Before we wrap up, my condolences on the death of some great Nigerian activist, Ken Wiwa, the son of Ken Sarawiwa, um, who pioneered the fight against Shell Corporation, crisscrossing with pipelines, Agoni land in Nigeria, and also Aranto Douglas. Oh, yes. Uh, we've, we've lost real great, great, great comrades and great fighters. And you know, Kesarawiwa was executed, was murdered by the Nigerian State 23 years ago. And just a couple of years ago, eventually, the United Nations Environment Program validated all that he was campaigning about. And now his son, Ken Jr., has been, he just made a feature in a documentary on Nigeria's environmental crisis and climate crisis. And now uh, he's, passed, he's passed away. And of course, my friend and brother, Orento Doppler, is all very painful. Nima Bassi, I want to thank you for being with us, Nigerian environmentalist activist. Um, he is the author of the new book, Oil Politics. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman from Marrakesh, Morocco.